You saw the audience scrambling. <laughs> Critic! I hope you heard that extra R. <laughs> the title of today's presentation comes from Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot. The tramps, as many of you will know, are trying to pass the time until the arrival of Godot. And one of the games that they invent is a slanging match, which begins accidentally when the normally polite pair interrupts one another. Do you, do you? Oh, pardon. Carry on. No, no, after you. No, no, you first. I interrupted you. On the contrary. They glare at each other angrily. Ceremonious ape, punctilious pig. Finish your phrase, I tell you. Finish your own. Silence. They draw closer. Halt. Moron. That's the idea. Let's abuse each other. They turn, move apart, turn again and face each other. Moron, vermin, abortion, morpion, sewer rat, curate, cretin, critic. <laughs> Those two hobos have lived rough. Estragon is beaten unnightly, nightly by unknown thugs. But the worst insult that either of them can muster is critic. To be a critic is worse than being a moron, an abortion, a curate, or a pubic louse, because that's what a morpion is. Let's remind ourselves why critic is such a dirty word. Imagine being a writer. Some of you are already writers, so in which case, imagine being yourself. For a year or more, you toil daily at your manuscript. There are times when you come close to despair, but you keep pouring your life's blood, your very soul, into those 300 painstaking pages. You read them again, you think this is a load of shit, and you start rewriting. Eventually, by donating a metaphorical kidney, you manage to get your book published. Then you open up the review section of the newspaper, and you read, Monsieur Flaubert, is not a writer. That was how Le Figaro's book reviewer summed up Madame Bovary in 1857. Gustave Flaubert was in good company. Almost every classic book worth its salt has had vicious detractors. The New Yorker felt that Catch-22 gasps for want of craft and sensibility. The book is an emotional hodgepodge. Heller wallows in his own laughter and finally drowns in it. What remains is a debris of sour jokes, stage anger, dirty words, synthetic looniness, and the sort of antic behavior that children fall into when they know they are losing our attention. The New York Times reported that Lolita is undeniably news in the world of books. Unfortunately, it is bad news. <laughs> there are two equally serious reasons why it isn't worth any adult's serious attention. The first, that it is dull, 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 in a pretentious, florid, and archly fatuous fashion. The second is that it is repulsive. <laughs> Luckily, these dire warnings are ignored by the common reader, by people like you and me. The common reader was defined by Dr. Johnson as the reader with common sense, someone uncorrupted by literary prejudices and the dogmatism of learning. And thanks to the common reader, the great Gatsby is never omitted from lists of the 200 best works of fiction, despite being greeted on publication with the judgment that Mr. Scott Fitzgerald deserves a good shaking. Here is an unmistakable talent unashamed of making itself a motley to the view. The great Gatsby is an absurd story. If it weren't for the common reader, generations of children might have missed out on Alice in Wonderland, about which an early reviewer complained, any real child might be more puzzled than enchanted by this stiff, overwrought story. Why do we have critics, then, if they always get it so badly wrong? I'm a critic, a book reviewer, and I can assure you that we often get it absolutely right. Sometimes we do see things that the common reader doesn't see. Oh, I see from your faces that you're waiting for an example. 
of how I saw something that you couldn't see, but I can't because I'm not dead yet. You see, it's only the passing of time that proves a critic right or wrong. You may remember that in 2012, a novel called The Luminaries won the Booker Prize, and Robert McFarlane, the chair of the committee, described it as a novel you pan, as if for gold and the returns are huge. But Kirsty Gunn, reviewing it, or panning it for The Guardian, said it was a great empty bag, an enormous wicked gleeful cheat. Which of the two is true? Time will tell. It's this problem of only hindsight having 2020 vision that led the Bookslut website to launch something called the Daphne Award, which rewards and honors the best book of 50 years ago. And just over 50 years ago, the critic with 2020 vision was Sylvain Zegel, who wrote in La Libération, theater lovers really have the pleasure of discovering a new author worthy of the name, an author who can give his dialogue true poetic force, who can animate his characters so vividly that the audience identifies with them, who deserves comparison with the greatest. In my opinion, Samuel Beckett's first play, Waiting for Godot at the Théâtre de Babylon, will be spoken of for a long time. Segel was a French critic. Waiting for Godot was originally written in French, and the French are good with the avant-garde. But would Beckett's play successfully cross the Channel, never mind the Atlantic? In case, I think it's unlikely with a literate audience like this, but in case you've never seen or read Waiting for Godot, it may help you to hear the summary of it by an American critic. The play concerns two tramps who inform each other and the audience at the outset that they smell. It takes place in what appears to be the town dump with a blasted tree rising out a welter of rusting junk, including plumbing parts. They talk gibberish to each other and to two symbolic maniacs for several hours, their dialogue punctuated every few minutes by such remarks as, what are we waiting for? Nothing is happening, and let's hang ourselves. The last was a good suggestion, unhappily discarded. Now, many agreed with this praise. The actor, Peter Bull, wonderful actor, played Pozzo in the original British production, gives this description of opening night. I have a habit of comforting myself on first nights by trying to think of appalling experiences during the war when terror struck from all sides. But the windiness felt on the Italian beachheads was nothing to compare with one's panic on that evening of August 3, 1955. Waves of hostility came whirling over the footlights and the mass exodus started quite soon after the curtain had risen. The audible groans were also quite disconcerting. <laughs> Peter Hall was the director of this production and 50 years later, this is what he remembers. By the time we opened, I, I was confident we had something special. The first night, therefore, came as uh, something of a shock. There were cheers, but there were also what are known in the trade as counter cheers. On the line, nothing happens, nobody comes, nobody goes, it's awful. A very English voice said loudly, here, here. <laughs> the critics next morning were not reassuring. Bafflement and derision were everywhere. The critic and columnist Bernard Levine said, Mr. Samuel Beckett, an Irishman who used to be Joyce's secretary and who writes in French, a combination which should make anybody smell a rat, has produced a really remarkable piece of twaddle. <laughs> it looked as if the play would have to close at the end of the week, but I begged the theatre owner to wait until the Sunday notices came in. Perhaps Godot would come, although it didn't seem very likely. Happily, he did, though, in the person of Harold Hobson, the critic of the Sunday Times. He found himself on the theatrical road to Damascus. He went on to write about the play for the next seven Sundays. And to my amazement, Godomania gripped London. It was discussed and praised and analyzed and abused. Cartoons were drawn about it. Panorama discussed it. Malcolm Muggeridge derided it. It was seen as an allegory of the Cold War. Metaphor had repossessed the theater. Well, Waiting for Godot continued and continues to divide audiences. Its first American production at the Coconut Grove in Miami was a spectacular flop. People walked out in droves. The queues at the box office the next day were not people buying tickets, but returning them. <laughs> it hadn't helped that the marketing gurus had billed the existentialist drama as the laugh sensation of two continents. 
But you know, there's always been one kind of audience that has always loved this play in whichever country it's been performed. Not an academic audience, no, but that one population in the world that truly understands what it means to wait. When the play was presented at Florida State Prison, the director <laughs> remembers how knowing nothing of theater etiquette the inmates on every other line, it seemed, rose from their seats and shouted out comments or questions to the actors. Why did you speak that way to him? Hey, what the hell do you mean by that remark? You two come down here. I got some things to say to you. At the end, the warden ordered the men to line up for the return to their cells. Suddenly, though, the inmates broke ranks and started racing towards the stage. I was terrified. But all they wanted to do was talk with us about the play specifically about the identity of Gado. The discussion was informed and eloquent beyond anything I'd ever known in the classroom. It's fascinating to set this experience against the widespread view of the time, which was that Beckett's work, because of its nihilism, because it did not ultimately affirm life, could not be called art. Now, some, some writers would argue that it is we critics who are Nihilistic, nihilistic. Certainly critics sometimes come across as sadistic and even homicidal. It is no discredit to Walt Whitman that he wrote Leaves of Grass, said the Atlantic, only that he did not burn it afterwards. <laughs> the Boston Intelligencer added insult to injury. We can conceive of no better reward than the lash for such a violation of decency. The author should be kicked from all decent society as below the level of the brute. He must be some escaped lunatic raving in pitiable delirium. Walt Whitman. <laughs> Emily Bronte received a similar body blow when Wuthering Heights was published. Graham's Ladies Magazine said, how a human being could have attempted such a book as the present without committing suicide before he had finished a dozen chapters is a mystery. It is a compound of vulgar depravity and unnatural horrors. <laughs> and a year later, Emily Bronte was dead, but not by suicide. Did the review kill her? Did a bad review kill John Keats, for that matter? Was it the excoriating reviews of Jude the Obscure that caused Thomas Hardy to stop writing novels? How destructive can a bad review really be? Now, Charlotte Bronte was at pains to assert that she and her sisters, Emily and Anne, were indifferent to negative criticism. They only cared for each other's trusted opinions. Though they collaborated in creating imaginative kingdoms as children, as adults, they wrote separately in secret until one day Charlotte Bronte came across a manuscript of her sister Emily's poems. These were not common effusions, nor at all like the poetry women generally write wrote Charlotte. I thought them condensed and terse, vigorous and genuine. To my ear they had also a peculiar music, wild, melancholy, and elevating. And unlike so many would-be authors, Emily didn't want to be discovered. It took her hours to be reconciled to the fact that her sister had discovered her manuscript, and it took days to be persuaded that the poems merited publication. So the three sisters decided to arrange a small selection of their poems and, if possible, get them printed. The Bronte sisters, as you know, felt obliged to write under pseudonyms, and in her preface to a posthumous edition of Wuthering Heights, Charlotte explains the choice. Averse to personal publicity, we veiled our own names under those of Curra, Ellis, and Acton Bell. We had a vague impression that authoresses are liable to be looked on with prejudice. The bringing out of our little book was hard work. As was to be expected, neither we nor our poems was wanted. The debut publication of three of the world's most famous women writers made no impression, no impression at all on critics or readers. Yet, says Charlotte, ill success failed to crush us. The mere effort to succeed had given a wonderful zest to existence. It must be pursued. So we each set to work on a prose tale. Emily's prose tale was the iconic Wuthering Heights. And after an early rejection, Charlotte's second attempt at a prose tale was Jane Eyre. Charlotte writes in the preface that when these novels appeared at last, 
critics failed to do them justice. The immature but very real powers revealed in Wuthering Heights were scarcely recognized. Its import and nature were misunderstood. The identity of its author was misrepresented. It was said that this was an earlier and ruder attempt of the same pen which had produced Jane Eyre. Unjust and grievous error. We laughed at it first, but I deeply lament it now. Only one critic, says Charlotte, discerned the real nature of Wuthering Heights and has with equal accuracy noted its beauties and touched on its faults. Too often do reviewers remind us of the mob of astrologers and Chaldeans and soothsayers gathered before the writing on the wall and unable to read the characters or make known the interpretation. We have a right to rejoice when a true seer comes at last, excellent spirit to whom have been given light, wisdom and understanding who can accurately read the men and men that take a low parts in an original mind and who can say with confidence, this is the interpretation thereof. Charlotte offers good advice to aspirant writers when she goes on to say that neither Ellis nor Acton allowed herself for one moment to sink under want of encouragement. Energy nerved the one and endurance upheld the other. They were both prepared to try again. But at that very moment, both of Charlotte's sisters succumbed to ill health. In the very heat and burden of the day, the laborers failed over their work. My sister Emily first declined. Never in all her life had she lingered over any task that lay before her, and she did not linger now. Day by day, when I saw with what a front she met suffering, I looked on her with an anguish of wonder and love. I have seen nothing like it, but indeed, I have never seen her parallel in anything. Stronger than a man, simpler than a child, her nature stood alone. She died December 19, 1848. And Anne died five months later. Charlotte goes on to ask, what more shall I say about them? I cannot and need not say much more. In externals, they were two unobtrusive women. A perfectly secluded life gave them retiring manners and habits. Neither Emily nor Anne was learned. They had no thought of filling their pitchers at the wellspring of other minds. They always wrote from the impulse of nature. I may sum up all by saying that for strangers, they were nothing. For superficial observers, less than nothing. But for those who had known them all their lives in intimacy of close relationship, they were genuinely good and truly great. The Brontes would probably be horrified by the fame that they enjoy today, not least because fame can take away the things a successful writer most needs, solitude and obscurity. Emily Bronte as authorpreneur. Can you see it? No. Nadine Gordimer believed that a serious person should try to write posthumously. <laughs> but what she meant by that was that you should aim for fame after your death, not before it. And among those who wrote posthumously was the poet John Keats. Now Keats wanted only these words, just these words written on his grave. Here lies one whose name was writ in water. But his friends were so certain that the bad reviews that he'd received for his long poem Endymion had killed him that they ignored his wish and they had the following engraved. This grave contains all that was mortal of a young English poet who on his deathbed in the bitterness of his heart at the malicious power of his enemies desired these words to be engraven on his tombstone. Here lies one whose name was writ in water. So who killed Keats? Lord Byron's letter to a friend re reveals the usual homicidal intention of the harsh critic. Here are Johnny Keats's pissabed poetry. No more Keats, I entreat. Flee him alive. And if some of you don't, I must skin him myself. There is no bearing the driveling idiotism of the mankin. And mankin was a cruel reference to Keats's lack of height. Keats would have remained probably blissfully ignorant of the slur on his pissabed poetry. It was rather this 1818 review in a magazine called The Quarterly 
that made Keats's friends cry foul. Reviews have been sometimes accused of not reading the works which they affected to criticize. On the present occasion, we shall anticipate the author's complaint and honestly confess that we have not read his work. Not that we have been wanting in our duty, far from it. We have made efforts almost as superhuman as the story itself appears to be to get through it. But with the fullest stretch of our perseverance, we are forced to confess that we have not been able to struggle beyond the first of the four books. It is not that Mr. Keats, if that be his real name, for we almost doubt that any man in his senses would put his real name to such a rhapsody. It is not, we say, that the author has not powers of language, rays of fancy and gleams of genius. He has all of these. But he is unhappily a disciple of the new school of what has somewhere been called Cockney poetry, which may be defined to consist of the most incongruous ideas and the most uncouth of language. When Keats first read this review, his response that he would write no more poetry, that's it, I'm not going to write anymore. He would instead, instead try to do what good he could to the world in other ways. And lucky for us, Keats recovered his dignity. To a kind friend who sent him snippets of better reviews, Keats wrote, I cannot but feel indebted to those gentlemen who have taken my part. As for the rest, I begin to get a little acquainted with my own strengths and weaknesses. Praise and blame has but a momentary effect on the man whose love of beauty in the abstract makes him a severe critic of his own works. And again, there have been two letters in my defense in the Chronicle and one in the Examiner. This is a mere matter of the moment. I think I shall be among the English poets after my death. One can't help thinking that perhaps that bad review only strengthened Keats's resolve to be among the English poets after his death. But perhaps that critic wasn't wrong, despite how hurtful he wrote. Apart from its famous opening line, a thing of beauty is a joy forever, Endymion is not much read anymore. Look, we're talking about a single poem that runs to four books in length, each book consisting of a thousand rhymes, a thousand lines of rhyming couplets. I mean, ain't nobody got time for that, least of all Keats himself. <laughs> but by the time the bad reviews came out, he had two years left to live. And now Keats began to live in a heightened state of inspiration, nursing his dying brother, falling in love, becoming aware of his own imminent mortality. And turning briefly from his brother Tom's deathbed, he wrote, I wish I could say that Tom was better. His identity presses upon me so all day that I am obliged to go out, although I had intended to have given some time to study alone. I am obliged to write, to ease myself of his countenance, his voice and feebleness, so that now I live in a continual fever. If I think of fame, of poetry, it seems a crime to me, and yet I must do so or suffer. Tom Keats died in December. And between the beginning of February and the beginning of June the following year, his grieving brother wrote his most famous poems. A stroll among the marbles of the British Museum brought about Ode on a Grecian Urn. A fit of mourning idleness inspired the Ode on Indolence. On the 15th of April, he sent off to his surviving brother in America the Ode to Psyche. About a week later, he heard the nightingale sing in his friend Brown's garden near his house. And Brown wrote, Keats felt a tranquil and continual joy in her song. And one morning he took his chair from the breakfast table to a grass plot under a plum where he sat for two or three hours. When he came into the house, I perceived he had some scraps of paper in his hand and he was quietly thrusting these behind books. On inquiry, I found those scraps, four or five in number, containing his poetic feeling on the Song of Our Nightingale. The writing was not well legible, and it was difficult to arrange the stanzas on so many scraps. With his assistance, I succeeded, and this was his ode to a nightingale. Immediately, I searched for more of his fugitive pieces, in which task, at my request, he again assisted me. From that day, he gave me permission to copy any verses he might write, and I fully availed myself of it. He cared so little for them himself when once his imagination was released from their influence that he required a friend at hand to preserve them. And Keats was now in a transcendent state. 
He wanted to write, from the mere yearning and fondness I have for the beautiful, even if my night's labors should be burnt every morning and no eye ever rest upon them. The weather was fine as he walked in nature, completely attuned to the beauty around him, impervious to his critics and indifferent to critical success. When I have fears that I may cease to be before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before high-piled books in charactery hold like rich garners the full ripened grain, when I behold upon the night's starred face huge cloudy symbols of a high romance, and think that I may never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance, and when I feel, fair creature of an hour, that I shall never look upon thee more, never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love, then on the shore of the wide world I stand alone and think till love and fame to nothingness do sink. It wouldn't have been the only occasion in which a bad review led to a fresh poetic outpouring. Thomas Hardy never wrote another novel after Jude the Obscure was so crudely dubbed Jude the Obscene by a reviewer who described the work as naked squalor and ugliness. Readers and critics alike could not handle the fact that Hardy's character slept with each other outside of wedlock and were especially repulsed by the scene in which Jude's children hang themselves. The eldest leaves behind a note which reads, Don, because we are too many. Hardy, who had become universally loved through Far From the Madding Crowd, now became universally hated. The Bishop of Wakefield was so disgusted by the novel that he threw his copy into the fire. The New York bookman called it simply one of the most objectionable books that we've ever read in any language whatsoever. And Hardy lived for another three decades after the publication of that, but he did not write another novel. That was the impact those reviews had. But when his wife Emma died, he began writing now the famous poems of 1912, 1913. Woman, much missed how you called to me, called to me, saying that now you are not as you were, when you had changed from the one who was old to me, but as at first when our day was fair. Who's to say whether these wonderful elegies would have been written if Hardy were still a practicing novelist? The good little Thomas Hardy, I should say. Because that's how Henry James, whose critical misery we will next consider, condescendingly referred to him. The good little Thomas Hardy, wrote Henry James, has scored a great success with Tess of the D'Urbervilles, which is chock full of faults and falsity, and yet has a singular charm. You know, we, we often make the mistake of imagining that writers of bygone eras were all or would have been on excellent terms, but the truth is that they were no fonder of each other than any other bunch of competitors. Coam Tobin brilliantly captures this authorial enmity in his fictionalized account of the life of Henry James. The novel's called The Master. And when it opens, we're following Henry James on the first night of a play that he'd written, Guy Domville. Now, James believes that this play is going to make his fortune, but he's a little bit nervous, so he decides to while away the time. He's not going to go to the opening night. He decides to while away the time between 8.30 and 10.45 by going to the Haymarket, another theatre, to see a new play by Oscar Wilde. And then he will make his way to the St. James Theatre, and he will arrive at the enraptured moment when his own play had ended. But... He still has these inter intervening hours to get through. And this is what Tobin writes. He would have given anything now to be three and a half hours into the future, to know the result, to bathe in the praise and the adulation. As the cab made its way to the theater, he felt a sudden, strange, new, fierce desolation. It was too much, he thought. He was asking too much. He forced himself to think about the scenery, the golden lighting, the costumes, and the drama itself, and those who had accepted the invitations. And he felt then only hope and excitement. He had shown Goss the list of those who would fill the stalls and dress circle. And Goss had said, oh, such a galaxy of aristocratic, literary, and scientific celebrity would gather in St. James's Theatre as had never before been seen in a London playhouse. Above them would be, how should he say it, the people who had paid money. 
The real audience whose support and applause would mean more than the support and applause of his friends. They were, he almost said it aloud, the people who do not read my books, for that is how we shall know them. Instantly, as soon as he set foot on the pavement outside the Haymarket, he became jealous of Oscar Wilde. There was a levity about those who were entering the theatre. They looked like people getting ready to enjoy themselves. He had never in his life, he felt, looked like that himself. And he did not know how he was going to manage these hours among people who seemed so jolly, so giddy, so jaunty, so generally cheerful. No one he saw, not one single face, no couple nor group, looked to him like people who would enjoy Guy Domville. As the curtain rose and the audience began to laugh at lines which he thought crude and clumsy, he felt under siege. He did not laugh, not once. He thought not a moment was funny. But more importantly, he thought not a moment was true. Every line, every scene was acted out as though silliness were a higher manifestation of truth. No opportunity was missed in portraying witlessness as wit. The obvious and shallow and glib provoked the audience into hearty and hilarious laughter. The writing, line by line, was a mockery of writing. An appeal for cheap laughs, cheap responses. The sense of a corrupt ruling class was shallow. The movement of the play was wooden, the play was badly made. Once it was over, he thought no one would remember it, and he would remember it only for the agony he felt, the pure, sheer tension about his own play going on just a short walk away. His drama was about renunciation, he thought, and these people had renounced nothing. At the end, they called the actors back for further bows, and he saw from their flushed and happy faces that they did not have any immediate plans to mend their ways. <laughs> As he walked across St. James's Square to learn his own fate, the complete success of what he had just seen seemed to him to constitute a dreadful premonition of the shipwreck of Guy Donville. And he stopped in the middle of the square, paralyzed by the terror of this probability, afraid to go and learn more. Later over years, he would hear hints and snatches of what had occurred. The paying public, it seemed, had begun to shift and shuffle cough and whisper, even before the first act was over. In the second act, they laughed when Mrs. Edward Saker appeared in her large and expansive period costume. And once they began to laugh, they began to enjoy being offensive. It was not long before the laughter turned to jeers. He learned later, much later also, what happened when Alexander uttered his last lines. I'm the last, my lord, of the Domvilles. Someone from the gallery had shouted, it's a damn good thing you are. <laughs> they hooted and roared, and when the curtain came down, they catcalled and yelled abuse as those in the stalls and dress circle applauded enthusiastically. He was told that they were wild shouts of author, author from his friends in the audience, but they were not wild enough for him to hear. Alexander heard them, however, because on catching the author's eye from the side of the stage, he approached him, his face solemn, his expression fixed, and led him slowly and firmly by the hand onto the stage. This was the crowd he'd imagined over those long days of rehearsal. He'd imagined them attentive and ready to be moved. He'd imagined them still and somber. He had not prepared himself for the chaos of noise and busy fluttering. He took it in for a moment, confused, and, and then he bowed. And when he lifted his head, he realized what he was facing. In the stalls and in the gallery, the members of the paying public were hissing and booing. He looked around and he saw mockery and contempt. The invited audience remained seated, still applauding, but the applause was drowned out by the crescendo of loud, rude disapproval which came from the people who had never read his books. So how does one recover from a public humiliation of that magnitude? It's a mystery, but two weeks later, Henry James made this entry into his notebook. I take up my own old pen again, the pen of all my old unforgettable efforts and sacred struggles. To myself, today, I need say no more. Large and full and high, the future still opens. It is now indeed that I may do the work of my life, and I will. While we obviously must admire this resolve in this notebook entry, we shouldn't forget that Guy Domville was not a great play, and Henry James could not see that. He would have preferred for his play to have been a success and for Wilde's play to have been a flop. I mean, he called Wilde variously a fatuous fool, a tenth-rate cad, and an unclean beast 
to his friends. As Claude Chabrol once said, sometimes you are the pigeon and sometimes you are the statue. <laughs> Clive James has a wonderful poem on this little spoken about subject of authorial enmity. It's called, The Book of My Enemy Has Been Reminded. The Book of My Enemy has been reminded and I'm pleased. In vast quantities it has been reminded like a van load of counterfeit that has been seized and sits in piles in a police warehouse. My enemy's much prized effort sits in piles in the kind of bookshop where remaindering occurs. Great square stacks of rejected books and between them aisles one passes down reflecting on life's vanities, pausing to remember all those thoughtful reviews lavished to no avail upon one's enemy's book. For behold, here is that book among these ranks and banks of duds, these ponderous and seemingly irreducible cairns of complete stiffs. The book of my enemy has been reminded, and I rejoice. It has gone with bowed head like a defeated legion beneath the yoke. What avail him now, his awards and prizes? The praise expended upon his meticulous technique, his individual new voice, knocked into the middle of next week. His brainchild now consorts with the bad buys, the sinker clinkers, dogs and dregs, the edsels of the world of movable type, the bummers that no amount of hype could shift the unbudgeable turkeys. Yea, his slim volume with its understated wrapper bathes in the blare of the brightly jacketed Hitler's war machine. His unmistakably individual new voice shares the same scrapyard with a forlorn skyscraper of the Kung Fu cookbook. <laughs> his honesty proclaimed by himself and believed by others his renowned abhorrence of all posturing and pretense is there with Pertwee's promenades and pierrots, 100 years of seaside entertainment. And oh, this above all, his sensibility, his sensibility in its hair-like filaments, his delicate, quivering sensibility is now as one with Barbara Windsor's Book of Boobs. <laughs> A volume graced by the descriptive rubric my boobs will give everyone hours of fun. <laughs> Soon now a book of mine could be remainded also, though not to the monumental extent in which the chastisement of remaindering has been meted out to the book of my enemy, since in, my, in the case of my book it'll be due to a miscalculated print run, a marketing error, nothing to do with merit. But just supposing that such an event should hold some slight element of sadness, it will be offset by the memory of the sweet moment. Chill the champagne and polish the crystal goblets. The book of my enemy has been remaindered, and I am glad. <laughs> so the moral of the story is don't believe all those friendly little coteries that you see at Franz Hook and Open Book and Wurtfjess and all those literary festivals. Wait until the authors are dead and their letters and diaries have been published. Then you will know what they think of one another. For example, what did Nabokov think of Hemingway? I read him for the first time in the early 40s, something about bells, bulls and balls, and loathed it. What did Gore Vidal say about John Updike? I can't stand him. Nobody will think to ask because I'm supposedly jealous, but I outsell him. I'm more popular than he is, and I don't take him very seriously. Oh, he comes on like a worker's son, like a modern-day D.H. Lawrence. But he's just another boring little middle-class boy hustling his way to the top if he can do it. <laughs> what did Mary McCarthy say about J.D. Salinger? I don't like Salinger, not at all. That last thing isn't a novel anyway, whatever it is. I don't like it, not at all. It suffers from this terrible sort of metropolitan sentimentality. And it's so narcissistic. And to me also, it seems so false, so calculated, combining the plain man with an absolutely megalomaniac egotism. I couldn't stand it. What did Martin Amos think of Miguel Cervantes? Oh, reading Don Quixote can be compared to an indefinite visit from your most impossible senior relative. With all his pranks and dirty habits and unstoppable reminiscences and terrible cronies, when the experience is over and the old boy checks out at last on page 846, the prose wedged tight with no breaks for dialogue, you will shed tears all right, not tears of relief or regret, but tears of pride. 
You made it, despite all that Don Quixote could do. <laughs> what does Samuel Johnson think of John Milton's Paradise Lost? Paradise Lost is one of the books in which the reader admires and lays down and forgets to take up again. <laughs> None ever wished it longer than it is. What did Ernest Hemingway think of James Jones, author of From Here to Eternity? To me, he is an enormously skilled fuck-up. And his book will do great damage to our country. Probably I should reread it again to give you a truer answer. But I do not have to eat an entire bowl of scabs to know they are scabs, nor suck a boil to know it is a boil, nor swim through a river of snot to know it is snot. A bad review can send an author spiraling down into the foot-stamping rages of childhood. Alain de Botton didn't like Caleb Crane's review of his book, The Pleasures and Sorrows of Work. So he said, I will hate you till the day I die and wish you nothing but ill will in every career move you make. <laughs> Niall Ferguson took against Pankaj Mishra's review of his book, Civilization. If he won't apologize for calling me a racist, I will persecute him until he does. <laughs> Norman Mailer took exception to Gore Vidal's review of The Prisoner of Sex, so he punched him at a party. And Gore Vidal shot back from the floor where he had fallen. Words fail Norman Mailer yet again. Richard Ford waited two years to get his revenge on Colson Whitehead, who'd panned Rich, uh, Ford's book, A Multitude of Sins, in the New York Times. And at last, he got his chance at a poets and writers party. Ford approached Whitehead and explained, exclaimed, I've waited two years for this. You spat on my book. And then he proceeded to spit on Whitehead, who called him a kid who needed to grow up. Richard Ford didn't cope well with bad reviews. Alice Hoffman wrote what Ford thought were nasty things about his book, The Sports Writer, again in the New York Times. So Ford took one of Hoffman's books into the backyard and shot it <laughs> with a gun before mailing the mutilated thing back to her. And he said about this, people make such a big deal out of it, shooting a book. It's not like I shot her. And before you start feeling sorry for Alice Hoffman, she of the Shot Up book, you should know that she herself responded to a lukewarm reviewer by, a lukewarm review by calling the reviewer a moron and an idiot before posting the hapless reviewer's phone number and personal email address on Twitter and encouraging fans to harass her. <laughs> There's a quote from Jules Renard, a French novelist who kept a marvelous writer's diary that helps to understand perhaps why writers actually need to hate one another's work. He wrote, I read novel upon novel. I stuff myself with them. I inflate myself with them. I'm full up to my throat with them in order that I may be disgusted with their commonplaces, their repetitions, their conventions, their systematic methods of procedure so that I may do otherwise. Is there a right way for a writer to react to a critic? Not everyone can turn the other cheek like a Bronte or grit their teeth and go on to create greater work as Keats Hardy and Henry James so heroically did. For James Joyce, a writer has three indispensable weapons, silence, exile, and conning. George Bernard Shaw's advice is helpful. I learned long ago never to wrestle with a pig. You get dirty, and besides, the pig likes it. Brendan Behan summed it up in this way. A critic at a performance is like a eunuch in a harem. He sees it perform nightly, but he cannot do it himself. <laughs> and hatred of critics has been there since the novel's earliest beginnings. Henry Fielding, one of the earliest novelists, wrote throughout his novel, Tom Jones, addressed an imaginary, rule-obsessed critic as my good reptile. And Lawrence Stern took this further in Tristram Shandy, of all the cants which are canted in this canting world, though the cant of hypocrites may be the worst, the cant of criticism is the most tormenting. The narrator of Tristram Shandy goes so far as to say, 
I would go 50 miles on foot, for I have not a horse worth riding on, to kiss the hand of that man whose generous heart will give up the reins of his imagination into his author's hands. Be pleased he knows not why and cares not wherefore. So is that the answer? To find a generous reader who is pleased by what she reads, not knowing or caring why what she reads is supposedly good. Chekhov doubted that any writer's psychology was that simple. He put two writers into his play, The Seagull. Trepliev is young and green, and his first play has displeased both his mother and his sweetheart, and Trigorin is a mature and successful writer. In this scene, Trepliev and Trigorin both encounter the young and beautiful Nina. Trepliev comes in without a hat on, carrying a gun and a dead seagull. Are you alone here? Yes. Trepliev lays the seagull by her feet. What do you mean by this? I was base enough today to kill the skull. I lay it at your feet. What's happening to you? She picks up the gull and stands looking at it. Trepliev, after a pause, so shall I soon end my own life. You've grown so irritable lately, and you talk so darkly and symbolically that you must forgive me if I fail to follow you. I am too simple to understand you. All this began when my play failed so dismally. A woman can never forgive failure. I have burnt the manuscript to the last page. Oh, if you could only fathom my unhappiness, your estrangement is to me terrible, incredible. It is as if I had suddenly waked up to find this lake dried up and sunk into the earth. You say you are too simple to understand me, but oh, what is there to understand? You dislike my play, you have no faith in my powers. You already think of me as commonplace and worthless as many are. How well I can understand your feelings, stamping his feet. And that understanding is to me like a dagger in the brain. May it be a curse together with my stupidity which sucks my lifeblood like a snake. He sees Trigorin approaching, reading a book. Oh, there comes real genius, striding along like another Hamlet and with a book too. Words, words, words. Oh, you feel the warmth of that sun already. You smile, your eyes melt and glow liquid in its rays. I shall not disturb you. And he goes out. And the famous older writer, Trigorin, now greets Nina. Oh, how are you, Miss Nina? Owing to an unforeseen development of circumstances, it seems that we are leaving here today. You and I shall probably never see each other again, and I am sorry for it. I seldom meet a young and pretty girl now. I can hardly remember what it feels to be 19. And the young girls in my books are seldom living characters. I should like to change places with you, if but for an hour, to look out at the world through your eyes and find out what sort of a little person you are. And I should like to change places with you. Why? To find out how a famous genius feels. What is it like to be famous? What sensations does it give you? What sensations? I don't believe it gives any. Either you exaggerate my fame, or else if it exists, all I can say is that one simply doesn't feel fame in any way. But when you read about yourself in the papers, oh, if the critics praise me, I am happy. If they condemn me, I am out of sorts for the next two days. Oh, this is a wonderful world. If you only knew how I envy you, men are born to, to different destinies. Some dully drag a weary, useless life behind them, lost in the crowd, unhappy, while to one out of a million, you, for example, comes a bright destiny full of interest and meaning. You are lucky. I? Lucky? Hmm. I hear you talking about fame and happiness and bright destinies, and those fine words of yours mean as much to me, forgive my saying so, as sweetmeats do, which I never eat. You are very young and very kind. Oh, but your life is beautiful. I see nothing especially lovely about it. Excuse me, I must go at once and begin writing again. I'm in a hurry, but, but let us discuss this bright and beautiful life of mine, though. Violent obsessions sometimes lay hold of a man. He may, for instance, think day and night of nothing but the moon. I have such a moon. Day and night I am held in the grip of one besetting thought, to write, write, write. 
Hardly have I finished one book than something urges me to write another and then a third and then a fourth I write ceaselessly. I am, as it were, on a treadmill. I hurry forever from one story to another and I can't help myself. Do you see anything bright and beautiful in that? Even now, thrilled as I am by talking to you, I do not forget for an instant that an unfinished story is waiting for me. I smell heliotrope. I mutter to myself a sickly smell, the color worn by widows. I must remember that in writing my next description of a summer evening. I catch an idea in every sentence of yours or of my own and hasten to lock all these treasures in my literary storeroom, thinking that one day they may be useful to me. Oh, but don't your inspiration and your act of creation give you moments of lofty happiness? Yes. Writing is a pleasure to me, and so is reading the proofs. But no sooner does a book leave the press than it becomes odious to me. It is not what I meant it to be. I made a mistake to write it at all. I am provoked and discouraged. Then the public reads it and says, yes, it is clever and pretty, but not nearly as good as Tolstoy. Or it is a lovely thing, but not as good as Turgenev's Fathers and Sons. And so it will always be. To my dying day, I shall hear people say, clever and pretty, clever and pretty, and nothing more. And when I am gone, those that knew me will say as they pass my grave, here lies Trigorin, a clever man, but he was not as good as Turgenev. And when the seagull first opened in St. Petersburg, October 1896, the booing was so loud that the actors had trouble hearing themselves. And Chekhov stopped writing plays for a few years. He wrote to a friend, the theater breathed malice. The air was compressed with hatred. And in accordance with the laws of physics, I was thrown out of Petersburg like a bomb. And then Chekhov asked for the play, which had been severely under-rehearsed and very badly cast, to be withdrawn. The theater refused. And two years later, the play was put on again, this time at the Moscow Art Theater, in a production directed by Konstantin Stanislavsky. And on opening night, after the first act, the curtain fell, and there was silence at a time when there was normally applause at the end of every act. The lead actress was close to tears. But then that applause came, and it hardly stopped. And thereafter, and ever since, and still today, the Moscow Art Theatre uses a drawing of a seagull as its logo. And to hear Chekhov's character griping about his good reviews, because he craves something even better, he craves superlatives, makes one think about how nowadays, and this is something I find truly troublesome, books that are just clever and pretty, and there's nothing wrong with being clever and pretty if you're a book, but these days books that are just clever and pretty are described as compulsively readable jaw-droppingly good, impossible to put down, delicate, spell-binding. <laughs> One reviewer described an Alice Munro book as a big dish of beluga caviar sailing in on a sparkling bed of rice with a mother-of-pearl spoon. <laughs> it's cloying enough to make one long for Dorothy Parker this is not a novel to be tossed aside lightly. It should be thrown with great force. <laughs> but perhaps all of these passionate responses to literature of the last 45 minutes, vitriolic or laudatory, may have left you feeling a little wondering and, and confused. How should one read a book? That is the title of an essay by Virginia Woolf. So let's hear her advice. Wait for the dust of reading to settle for the conflict and the questioning to die down. Walk, talk, pull the dead petals from a rose, or fall asleep. Then suddenly, without our willing it, the book will return, but differently. It will float to the top of the mind as a whole. Details now fit themselves into their places. We see the shape from start to finish. It is a barn, a pigsty, or a cathedral. Now then, we can compare book with book as we compare building with building. But this act of comparison means that our attitude has changed. We're no longer the friends of the writer. Now we are his judges. And just as we cannot be too sympathetic as friends, so as judges we cannot be too severe. Are there not criminals, books that have wasted our time and sympathy? 
Are they not the most insidious enemies of society? Corruptors, defilers, the writers of false books, faked books, books that fill the air with decay and disease. Let us then be severe in our judgments. Let us compare each book with the greatest of its kind. There they hang in the mind the shapes of the books we have read, solidified by the judgments that we have passed on them. Robinson Crusoe, Emma, The Return of the Native. Compare the novels with these. Even the latest and least of novels has a right to be judged with the best. So here's your choice. To be reviewed either by Virginia Woolf using these exacting standards or by Oscar Wilde. In the critic as artist, Wilde's spokesman Gilbert announces, anybody can write a three-volume novel. It merely requires a complete ignorance of both life and literature. <laughs> it is sometimes said of book reviewers that they do not read through the works they are called upon to criticize. They do not, or at least they should not. It is not necessary. To know the vintage and quality of a wine, one need not drink the whole cask. It must be perfectly easy in an hour to say whether a book is worth anything or worth nothing. Ten minutes are really sufficient if one has the instinct for form. Who wants to wade through a dull volume? One tastes it, and that is quite enough, more than enough, I should imagine. Oscar Wilde once admitted, I've never read a book I must review. It prejudices you so. (laughs) I wonder if that thought comforted him when he read a reviewer's description of the picture of Dorian Gray, which was unmanly, sickening, vicious, tedious, and stupid. Mr. Wilde has again been writing stuff that were better unwritten. In all our discussion of critics and criticism this afternoon, we haven't spared a thought for the work itself. How does the book feel about being dissected? How does the poem feel about being interpreted? Here's a recent poem by Fanula Dowling on the subject. It's called The Abuse of Cauliflowers. When I think of poetry critics, poetry academics, I think of the way I make cauliflower soup, how I hack at the white flowers, how I toss them about in buttery onions and curry powder, how I boil them in milk and vegetable stock, and then pound the whole lot up with a mechanical blender and serve the resulting mess with stinky blue cheese. I never dwell for a moment on the cauliflower's pre-soup thoughts, its pre-soup longings. It's as if I don't care how once this cauliflower lay in bed beside another cauliflower and the two of them made stock jokes, mocked celery, and whispered from the very bottom of their cauliflowerness about wanting to be loved for themselves. Thank you very much for your attention.